Annie has come to the neighboring parish of Macduff to meet Professor Marjorie Harper. Hello, Marjorie. Marjorie has evidence that may throw light on the orphan Jessie's fate. The trail begins a generation back with Jessie's mother, Mary, and the circumstances of her birth. The first clue lies in the record of Mary's baptism, which took place in this church in 1821. So here's the baptismal record for Mary. There she is, Mary, N.D. And what does N.D. mean? Well, N.D. means natural daughter. It means that she was born illegitimately. Ah, natural daughter. So, ah, to James Rose Writer. That means solicitor. Oh, OK. So Mary's father was actually a solicitor, probably practising in Banff. Well, he's an established man. He's certainly not a no. pauper. No. And Mary's mother, her name is Anne Stewart. Yeah. I wonder what her background would have been. Well, we do know a little bit about Anne Stewart's background, and it was a rather different background from James Rose's. It seems likely her father was a crofter. Yes, well, I mean, if Anne was the daughter of a crofter, then she was very much lower class. Yes, we simply don't know how they met. Do we happen to know anything more about James Rose? Yes, we do. We do know, for example, that he did not marry Anne Stewart. Mm. He, in fact, married somebody else. Right. And what we have in the next document is his marriage certificate. OK, so... Here we are. Mr James Rose and Miss Isabella Folder, December 15th, 1821. So... so we go his back to the original... His illegitimate daughter, yeah. Mary... Oh, she was just a few months old. Yes. Yeah. When he Is married she... somebody else. Yes, OK. So, so we that might... was no, no, I guess, no contact with the father. We might speculate that at the time Mary was born, that James was already betrothed, engaged right. to Miss Isabella Folder. So oh, we don't okay. know what Miss Isabella Folder would have okay. made of these matters. Solicitor James Rose had a relationship with Anne Stewart, which resulted in the birth of Mary. Shortly after, he married Miss Isabella Folder. Mary grew up in Banff and had five children, including Jessie. When the census was taken in 1851, Mary's husband had just died. She was recorded as a pauper. Marjorie is taking Annie to show her where Mary and her children lived. We know from the 1851 census that the family was living in Carmelite Close, which would have been close off uh, Carmelite Street. This is the only close that's left. And so we'll go in here right. and have a look at okay. what it might have been like. As you can see, it's quite a confined little area. Oh, wow, look at this. So this is where Mary and the children lived. You can just imagine kids barefoot, lots of them, women in shawls and heads, you know, sort of head scarves and overcrowding. It's very unlikely that they would have had a whole house. They would have had a room or a couple a room. of rooms and yes. often Rooms were subdivided, so you had families living in extremely close proximity. Certainly there would have been very little light in these closes and within the houses, yeah. very, very dark. So um, this census was taken on the night of the 30th of March, 1851. And this is where Mary was a widow yes. and a pauper. Yes. Mm. And Jessie was just like three, a little tiny three-year-old little thingy thing, Bernie. And then on the very same night that the census was taken here and recorded Mary with her five children, the census also recorded James Rose, Mary's father, living in Banff with his very different family and living just really round the corner. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's around the corner. That's incredible. <laughs> Are we going to go and see it? We are indeed. So here we are coming around just off Carmelite Street onto High Shore and as you see from the census we have six High Shore and the Rose oh. family living here. So oh, we're on the right okay. street. Okay. So just really around the corner right. from Mary and, and her family. This is where James Rose would have had his house probably, where this, this car park is right. and they would have had a good view out to sea. And here we have the census entry that shows who actually lived in the house okay. at Six High Shore. So you see James and his wife Isabella. Three daughters. Yes. Jane, Georgina and Jemima, Jemima. Rose. 
and we find that also living in the house, they have two servants. So James and his wife were living in very different circumstances. Oh, they both have, and they have, they have two, two servants. servants. Whereas Mary has she's five children and she's living yes. as a pauper. Yes. It's quite strange, isn't it? It really juxtaposed with each other. That's unbelievable. His daughter and grandchildren lived absolutely just a few yards away around the corner in a, in a, a sort of and complete sort of probably like a hovel and you wonder nowadays like how could that possibly be you know James Rose passing his daughter and his grandchildren the street you wonder did he acknowledge her did he acknowledge the children probably not because I mean she has been registered as a pauper that's right you know, he could have possibly, being such a wealthy man, made, ensured that his daughter maybe had a job or maybe even worked for him or whatever. But there's just that big divide, it's just that big denial of existence, clearly. So there's a final twist to the story. Ah, that I think well, I am curious. puts another piece into that jigsaw. These are baptismal certificates, and the first is for James Rose, born in June the 10th, 1794. And then we move on two years to another baptismal entry, same parents. So here we have February 1796. And a daughter. Anne Rose. So we've had two baptismal certificates. We've had James Rose and his sister. And then we move on to the 19th century and to 1829 to a marriage register. And we find Anne Rose's marriage to John Cruikshank, marriage in the parish of Turriff. OK, OK. So, wait a second here. I'm making a connection. Anne Rose is James Rose's sister. That's right. She marries a man called Cruikshank, so she becomes Mrs Cruikshank. Mrs Cruikshank must be the woman that we heard about earlier who was taking care of Jessie, but she had no longer any use mm -hmm. for her. So that means that Mrs. Cruikshank was Jessie's great aunt. That's it. Hmm. The dots are finally joined. Oh. So there's our Mrs. Cruikshank. So James Rose had a sister, Anne, who became Mrs. Cruikshank. It seems this is who Jessie Fraser was sent to live with at some point between the ages of five and ten. So obviously, James Rose decided that Jesse should be taken in by his sister. I think James Rose is the real enigma in the whole story. Mm -hmm. He didn't act when Mary, his daughter, was widowed. So why did he then act subsequently? It could be that the initiative came from his sister, Anne, who needed yeah, she could some sort of help, exactly. who had use yes. for... That's, Jessie. oh, well, I need to have a servant. Ah, I know of an orphaned child, you know, my, my, his grandchild. Mm -hmm. James Rose must have had a hand in all of that. But the feeling is not that he's doing it out of love um, or compassion. The feeling is that there's a child there that could be of benefit to Mrs. Cruikshank because she says very clearly in the parochial records that... Uh, Jessie is of no further use. Jessie was seen very much as a commodity. A it commodity, would seem. yes. Mm -hmm. There's no love there. Mrs. Cruikshank kicked her out, basically. Yes. So, I mean, if she had really cared for her, a child of ten, mm -hmm. she would have. There's no way she would have kicked her out. This, it's um, people ooh. living cheek by jowl. Ooh. What is known, ooh. what is not known. Yeah, in the middle of a very close, closed society. The whole thing is very dark. It's a, it's a very Victorian melodrama to me.